Ever since I first started learning about the Titanic story, I've been really interested in knowing more about the breakup and the sinking process. It may be in part thanks to the 1997 film, as I'm sure it is the same with a lot of you watching at home as well. But there's a question in this, because watching the 1997 film, you might be mistaken for thinking, well, if the breakup of Titanic was so obvious as depicted in that movie, then why at the British Wreck Inquiry and the Senate Inquiries held after the sinking of Titanic, did they come to the conclusion that the ship sank in one piece? It seems really unusual, and for the longest time, I thought that most passengers actually didn't see it break up at all, that it was only a select few. But if you've read this book here, On a Sea of Glass, there's dozens of passengers who saw it ripping itself apart. And this is really interesting, because while a large number of passengers say they saw the ship sink in one piece, probably an equal amount saw it actually breaking in half. So what was it about that night that caused half of the witnesses to say it sank one way, and the other half who said it sank another? Well, today what we're going to do is try and animate the sinking as it may have looked like for passengers that night who are actually sitting in a lifeboat, dead on, watching it sink. But to do that, we first need to rewind a little bit and get an understanding of the way that we see Titanic sinking today and how media has kind of, you know, played a little bit of a role in, in shaping the way that we see it. Now first, let's have a look at the way that Titanic sinking has already been depicted in media and film, because media changes the way that we see historical events and it kind of shapes the way that we think things might have happened. So in the context of Titanic, the sinking has been portrayed, you know, quite a few times. There's the, probably the most famous and well-known sinking uh, sequence from the 1997 20th Century Fox, uh, James Cameron directed film, Titanic. Then of course, A Night to Remember from the 50s, uh, the other 1950s Titanic film, Titanic. And some series as well, specifically we'll talk more about the 2012 miniseries that show Titanic sinking in various different ways. And they all look distinctly different from one another. This is a really important thing here because you've got a historical event that actually happened over here and then the creative team behind this film over here doing their best to try and bring this back to life. But they can only use their imagination. So they're going to try and bring this historic event back to life using techniques that they think would make it look the way they think it might have looked. Now this is really important because it means whatever the film shows is the director's idea of what happened. It doesn't mean it's necessarily what it really looked like. So we'll start with the 1997 James Cameron directed film. You see Titanic with its stern way up in the air and the lights flicker out. It's a horrifying moment. And you have to remember James Cameron is a brilliant action director. And this is what he does best. And as soon as the lights go out, you'll notice it's still pretty bright. There's this uh, God light that's shining over everything and it's casting this this blue light over everything so you can still see what's going on and this is really important because we know on the night the titanic sank it was a moonless night there was no moon to illuminate to cause this kind of light but it was incredibly starry it was a brilliant brilliant clear night there was no light pollution that you'd get standing in the middle of the city today so you could see all the stars and it looked absolutely spectacular but it meant that Objects at a distance had almost no light shining on them. And there are two bits of testimony that stand out in my mind. The first is James Bissett, who was an officer on board Carpathia, which was the ship that was rushing to rescue Titanic's passengers. I did a video on that. I'll uh, put a link in the description because it's worth watching. But the Carpathia was charging through the night. They almost smashed straight into an iceberg like Titanic had. The only way that Bissett saw it in time is uh, some stars were reflecting off the surface uh, the top of the iceberg because there was no moon even though an iceberg is a big white piece of ice it should be easy to see it looked pitch black against the horizon and they just saw some stars just reflecting off of it and another way that we can tell that it was extremely extremely dark and objects would have looked nothing like they they appear in the 97 film is that both Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee who were the two lookouts on board Titanic that night when she struck the iceberg didn't say they saw an iceberg in their testimony they say they saw a black shape on the horizon and this is really important because they probably connected the dots and said, oh, that's an iceberg. But it appeared like just a black form. So when we think about the 97 Cameron film, when the lights go out, you can see all the detail. You can count the rivets down the hull of Titanic. 
And of course, this is a Hollywood piece of media and entertainment, right? So James Cameron's primary objective is to make sure that you as the viewer are entertained and you can see everything on screen and you're enjoying what you're seeing. So they make creative decisions to this effect. Now, Ken Marshall, who's an absolute hero of mine and brilliant maritime painter and historian, served as a technical consultant on the 97 Cameron film. And there were many times, apparently, when James Cameron would come up to him and say, look, I'm really sorry, you've uh, told me exactly how many lights there are on the exterior of the ship, but I just had to put more on so I could get more light onto my actors so we can see more of what's going on. Another great example of this, down in the dining saloon, Titanic's dining saloon tables did not have lamps on them, but in that scene, they do. And the only reason for that is so that the actors had more light shining up at them to illuminate their faces and, and, and make them seem more natural so that shadows don't fall on their faces. Like me right now, I've got two lights uh, shining straight in my face at all times and I still get shadows on my face. So lighting a scene is really, really important. Another creative decision they made on Titanic is casting this blue light over everything. They want you to know that it was a cold night. And so the way to do that is cast a cool hue of blue across everything. This is called color grading and directors and production teams do it all the time to make you, the viewer, feel something. So for example, you might have watched Breaking Bad or any TV series that has a scene set in Mexico. They always apply this yellow tinge in the color grading to make Mexico feel a little exotic and really warm. If you've ever been to Mexico, believe it or not, uh, there's not a yellow tinge on everything, but they want you to feel like you're somewhere else that isn't the United States and that it's warm. It's hot in Mexico, right? Saving Private Ryan. They wanted the film to feel gritty and realistic and a little bit like World War II newsreel. So they desaturated the colors way down and made it look a little bit black and white, like one of those old newsreel films. And it totally works. So it creates a mood. The Titanic, they want you to feel cold when you're watching this scene. So everything is blue. Now that has really colored the way that a lot of people see the sinking of Titanic because in a lot of contemporary depictions now, you'll see everything's all blue and washed out. Hell, even I've done it. You know, again, it's a creative decision. It probably wouldn't have looked like that in real life. So we know on the night of the sinking, it was extremely dark. And this is really important because again, um, on A Night to Remember, it looks like it was shot during daytime and it's really bright and clear. And again, if it was that clear and bright, how could anyone have ever argued if Titanic broke in half or sank intact? You watch Titanic, 1997's Titanic, when it breaks in half, it's so obvious. So how could people have argued against that and say, well, one side saying, no, it broke in half, and the other group saying, well, we saw it sink intact. Another thing that comes into play here is the sheer scale of Titanic and the witnesses' viewpoint of the sinking. If you are sitting side on to the sinking ship and a fair way away, you have a great vantage point to see the ship breaking side on. If you're really, really up close, you're not seeing the whole ship. You don't have this omnipotent, you know, bird's eye view of the sinking so you know everything that's going on. It's suddenly pitch black because the lights have gone out and there's no moon. And if you are up close and slightly to the side, so you're looking down the length of the ship, it's not going to be very obvious at all that the Titanic has broken in half. Now, one of my absolute favorite depictions of the Titanic sinking was from the 2012 miniseries because they kind of bucked the trend a little bit, had the camera dipping in and out of the water as if you yourself were being immersed and the breaking up of the Titanic happens kind of in the background and, and you can see it's a little more subtle. It's not this very obvious break like the 97 film. In the 97 film, the Titanic stern just crashes down with this huge wave. And as a viewer, you think, well, everyone must have seen and felt that. But in the 2012 miniseries, it's a lot more subtle. And this now brings me to my final point, which is this idea of how the Titanic broke in half in the first place. You've got something the size of multiple city blocks in length that's the height of a 10 or 15 story building. And it's made up of a lot of individual pieces that all begin to fail and still has a degree of plasticity. It's not just like glass. It's not going to shatter and immediately the ship's going to have exploded apart. Even in normal operation, the ship would be expected to bend and sag up to multiple inches at a time as it crested over the top of the big waves, kind of like this. So you can imagine that as Titanic's breaking apart, the steel is failing, but it's doing so slowly as each individual member gives out from the strain and the stern begins to fall back, probably gradually 
into the water without any massive violence creating this huge wave like you see in the 1997 film. That would make it a lot harder to see. So if you take these multiple things into consideration, that it's pitch black, there's no moon, you're probably fairly close up to the ship, paying attention not to the ship so much, but to saving yourself and to how cold the water is. And third of all, the ship is breaking up slowly and gradually. So what would it have looked like on the night in reality? Well, let's animate it and find out. Just a couple months ago, I animated this for the 110th anniversary of the wreck. Here's the animation. Now I've color graded this and done the lighting to look a little bit like the James Cameron movie to begin with. You can see it's nice and bright. And what we're gonna do is just play this animation and I'm going to narrate a little bit of what's going on. And then what we're going to do is we're going to turn the lights off and we're going to make the lighting look a lot more like it might've looked like on a moonless night on the North Atlantic Ocean. And you can tell me honestly and truthfully if you would be very confident at an inquiry in saying that you saw Titanic break in half. Okay, here we go. So Titanic's lights flicker out at around about the time that her, her back breaks. And now the stern is falling back gradually and slowly into the water as the funnels collapse. And the bow section, you can just see there to the right, separates from the stern and drops away. And as it drops away, the stern now can float on its own as its own individual hull form, but now the sheer weight of the engines that are just sitting there at that now torn off section pull the stern up and back so that it begins to flood. And now it's being pulled down into the water by the weight of these engines and it's done. In an alternate reality, it is not impossible to think that the stern could have separated entirely from the bow section, say the engines got ripped out of it, and it could have floated there. But I think that the sheer weight of these engines pulled her down and now the ship begins on its final plunge to the sea floor. You may notice that there's a small lamp burning on the aftermast there. There are some accounts of lights remaining on the Titanic. Now to what degree these were, whether it was a full emergency set that was burning until the end, I don't know entirely. There were some who say they saw one light, one or two lights still flickering. This could have been an oil lamp that was rigged to the mast there just to provide some visibility to passengers that night that they didn't extinguish before the sinking. Either way, I've just put it there to orient ourselves a little bit so you can see what's going on. And there, Titanic is slipping below the waves and she's done. Now what we're going to do is play that exact same animation from exactly the same viewpoint, but we're just going to tweak the lighting to seem more natural and realistic as if it were a moonless night and watch the sinking again. And you can see straight away how much more disorienting and confusing this would have been that you're not looking so much at a ship sinking now, you're looking at just a black mass illuminated only by the stars behind it. And I think only the most astute of people would have picked up that, oh, this ship has broken in half. The other thing that's going on here is how people interpret the sound of what's going on. I don't think I've ever really been able to accurately replicate this sound, but it's been described as like a constant roar, like ongoing thunder. And it really reminds me of the sound of the Twin Tower collapse in 2001. It just sounded like this freight train roaring sound. Now on the night of the sinking, a lot of those who thought the ship sank intact interpreted this noise as the boilers and the engines falling through the uh, bulkheads of the ship as they came loose from their seating. We know that that didn't happen because they're all still intact on the wreck, the engines included. So what they were really hearing was the ship tearing itself apart. But in the pitch black, when you can't exactly see what's going on, you're sitting there interpreting this as, well, the ship's sinking in one piece and everything that's loose in the ship is now tumbling forward and it's creating this, this roaring noise. So there you have it. I love the James Cameron film. I really enjoy A Night to Remember, but it's interesting to think that our idea of what Titanic might have looked like sinking has been shaped and changed by this media over the years, and that Titanic sinking may have looked starkly different to what we have in mind. It's a pretty scary picture to be honest with you, and I don't think I would have wanted to be there that night. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. Every little bit helps, and I aim to make a video like this once every week, so you'd hate to miss out. 
or you can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.